All right, welcome to the MPCA Affiliate Group Network Annual Meeting. Thank you for spending your Saturday afternoon with us. Some of us might be Saturday evening. I just got a note that somebody is joining us from Lisbon. So um, thank you. Um, thank you to the MPCA staff and of course our new affiliate group network coordinator, Christina Owens, um, who all worked so hard to pull this important gathering together. Um, my name is Mary Owen Thomas. I'm the chair of the MPCA board. Um, I was formerly a member elected director for six years representing the upper Midwest region. Um, I'm based in Chicago, where prior to joining the MPCA community, I was active in my local affiliate group for eight years. Shout out to the Chicago Area Peace Corps Association, CAPCA, which is where I met all my first friends when I moved to Chicago 15 years ago after Peace Corps. Um, so I know firsthand the role of the affiliate groups is really critical, um, especially to the mission of MPCA. Um, our mission of fostering a vibrant and united Peace Corps community. You all are on the front lines of our advocacy work, which you'll hear more about today, and you push MPCA to be better. Um, before I introduce our MC for the afternoon, I just want to provide a couple updates. Um, I'm pleased to announce that uh, Dan Baker, who is the MPCA Director of Programs and Business Development, will take over on Monday as our interim president and CEO. Um, he's gonna replace Kim Herman, who thank you, graciously filled in on a pro bono basis for the last few months um, after the departure of Glenn Bloomhurst. Um, I wanna also take this moment to acknowledge the strong relationships that Glenn built and maintained with our key stakeholders in our community, as well as his contribution to the overall upward trajectory of this organization through his tenure. Um, Dan is a familiar face for many. Prior to working for MPCA, I had the honor of serving on the board with him. He brings an impressive and vast portfolio of experience that includes working for Peace Corps for 13 years. Um, I'm really thankful for Dan's willingness to step into this role on a temporary basis as the CEO search committee continues their efforts to hire a permanent president and CEO. Um, we're close to picking a search firm and we're committed to engaging the entire community in this process. So my second announcement is the creation of a subcommittee on governance reform. Um, during this transition, we're also looking at our internal structures to ensure that we're not only being efficient, but also responding to the needs of our community and organization. Um, the two individuals who will be leading this effort are returning board director, Christina Owens, who I'll formally introduce in a minute, and new board director, John Evans. Um, I'll let Christina speak more about this, but I know she wants to engage the community in that effort and will be looking for volunteers. So, all right, let's get this program started. I will formally introduce Christina Owens, who no relation to myself, even though we have similar last names. Um, she is our new affiliate group network coordinator, and yeah. as um, I think I mentioned, this is her second stint on the board, so again, we thank her for her service. Christina served in Bolivia from 2000 to 2002 and is a second generation RPCB. Her sister is also an RPCB, so it's definitely a family affair. Um, in 2008, Christina got involved with MPCA advocacy, and then from 2009 to 2012, she served on the board of the Return Peace Corps Volunteers of Washington, D.C., RPCBW, where she led their effort to commemorate the 50th anniversary of Peace Corps on September 25th, 2011, with a wreath-laying program and walk of flags. In 2012, she joined the MPCA Board of Directors as the Mid-Atlantic Nationwide Member Elected Director. She was active in the governance and chair of the advocacy and policy committee. And after finishing her term in 2015, she continued serving as board emeritus on various initiatives, such as Peace Corps Connect to the Future and Advocacy. So Christina, I now hand this over to you. Great, thank you, Mary. That was a great introduction. Um, and thank you. Um, there's a lot of exciting things um, happening, but I just wanted to tell you um, I am so honored to serve as your AGN coordinator. I'm so excited to do this. There's so many um, great um, possibilities. So as you know, over the years, I've seen some pretty amazing things um, from affiliate groups. And, and as Mary had mentioned, I helped plan the 50th anniversary of the um, Peace Corps for, as a board member of RPCBW. 
And we knew right away that we couldn't do it by ourselves. So we tapped into the affiliate group network and many of you helped us make that successful. This was such a positive experience. And as you heard from um, Mary, not only I'm from a Peace Corps family, but um, my dad served in the Peace Corps in Peru from 1970 to 73. Maybe there's a couple uh, fellow group um, Peru volunteers out there. He married my mother who's from Peru. And so not only did I grow up bilingual and bicultural, but also with those Peace Corps ideals. Um, so since the 50th, as you know, I've done a couple things and I was excited to be able to join again. Um, I'm excited to tap into the wealth of knowledge that we have throughout this network and to be your advocate as a member of the MPCA Board of Directors. As you heard that I will be co-chairing with um, John Lee Evans, a fellow board member on the governance reform subcommittee of the governance committee. And we will definitely be looking to tap into this affiliate group network to, um, to get feedback as well. <clears throat> um, as leaders, you are instrumental to the success of this community. And finally, before we get started, I want to acknowledge the amazing MPCA staff that have been instrumental in preparing this meeting, especially Ari Richards, who has helped me navigate my roles and responsibilities as AGN coordinator. So, whoa. Now, before we begin, I would like to um, take a moment of silence to honor the RPCVs that have passed um, in the last year, RPCV leaders. If you would like, you can put it in the chat and we'll, um, so we can see who to acknowledge. Thank you. So I now call our meeting to order. Um, if you haven't done so, rename yourself in the participant list with your name and group. If you're an official voting delegate for your group, only, of course, only one allowed per group, and you have not yet registered as the voting delegate, please respond to our brief survey. And um, thank you, Julie, for for putting that in the chat. In case you haven't had the chance, please take a look, please take a look at the um, 2021 AGNEM um, minutes as we will be opening a vote to approve them in a few minutes. Okay, next slide. Okay, I just wanted to go over our affiliate group network objectives. So the affiliate group network was is actually in within the bylaws of MPCA. So it's a very important part of our um, the function of MPCA. And our objectives is to connect affiliate groups and to share best practices. And you all do that on a regular basis. To provide group leadership with direct insight into MPCA capacity building initiatives, projects, and opportunities. And to keep groups connected throughout the year. For this meeting's objectives, I want to make sure we want to be sure that everybody's informed. We'll hear updates from advocacy, like from Jonathan, also from the task force that have um, been going ongoing throughout the summer, and also to reconnect, um, and uh, and finally to be inspired. There's a lot of really great work going on, um, and it will be exciting to um, to connect and move forward this year. Okay, so before I want to welcome um, the two new um, affiliate groups since last AGNAM. And this, the first group is RPCVs at DHS, and they will serve as an official non labor employee group to promote community service, social, and professional interactions within DHS and the RPCV community with counterparts in other agencies to encourage DHS to hire eligible RPCVs and support the third goal of the Peace Corps. Welcome. And I think somebody will be placing their contact information into the chat. 
Um, and then the next um, group that we want to welcome is the LGBTQI plus RPCVs as a re recently renewed group that had been previously doormat with, um, with support LGBTQ plus applicants, volunteers, and RPCVs, and will advocate for inclusive policies throughout Peace Corps. Welcome. So keep an eye out on AGN Facebook page and the MPCA on affiliate group newsletter to see updates and information from these groups. Okay, so this is the, the approval of the 2021 minutes. And I think I would like to move for the approval and I think we need a second or somebody needs to move it. Oh, second. Okay, so Maggie from Friends of Paraguay second it. I would call that this has passed, then I'm assuming if we can confirm that with our staff. Thank you. Okay. I think we can go to the next slide. So now we're gonna hear an update from Jonathan Pearson. Um, before that, I want I would like to um to do a special introduction to Jonathan, um, our NPCA advocacy director. Um, when I first got involved, I got involved with um, through advocacy and I loved it and I have not stopped. He was instrumental and inspiring for all, for me to get involved, but also probably to all of you. Uh, and uh, today I want to um, also acknowledge his colleagues, um, Joel Rubin, who served in Costa Rica and he serves, he's an expert in foreign policy, congressional relations, and the media. Um, with deep experiences in domestic policies, he served in the Obama Biden administration. And you may have seen him on some of the cable news shows. And then Miriam Foote, who served in Benin from 2018 to 2020. She was evac evacuated, one of the evacuees, and she is now the advocacy and administrative associate and community outreach specialist. She has been involved in advocacy since she's been evacuated and was, in, was involved in the um, Peace Corps Connect to the Future as well. I had the honor of working with her. Finally, I also want to give a shout out to the interns. Without the help of interns and volunteers, some of the work that Jonathan done, done could not be accomplished. And they were, this past year was Isabel Frasca, Pia Garg, Rachel Edwards, and Dominic Ryder. And I will now pass it on to Jonathan. Well, thank you very much, Christina, and thank you, and, and through you, thank you for your advocacy over many, many years, and I know many people on this uh, webinar have been very active with advocacy, and, and we literally could not do it without you, so we're so grateful for all you do, and if we could go to the next slide, uh, we are, I, when we put this slide together and it said, let's make history, I want to say something about this. This is not hyperbole. We are on the cusp of passing the most significant Peace Corps legislation in a generation. It's been more than 20 years since the Peace Corps Reauthorization Act has been fully reauthorized. And we've got a chance this year, we've got a lot of work ahead of us, but we've made tremendous progress in the last year and a half to get us to the point where we are. And we have two pieces of legislation in both houses of Congress. Uh, the House bill is HR 1456, introduced by uh, John Garamendi. Thank you, uh, Representative Garamendi, who served as a Peace Corps volunteer in Ethiopia, uh, prepared this legislation, working in a bipartisan manner with Representative Garrett Graves of Louisiana. They've been great um, comrades in work on Peace Corps legislation. And this bill went before the House Foreign Affairs Committee and it passed out of the committee by a vote of 44 to four. There were 16, 17 Republicans who joined all the Democrats on the committee in putting this uh, uh, legislation forward. And we've got similar activity in the Senate where there's an, a bill, Senate Bill 4466, which was just introduced a couple of months ago after a lot of work by the Senate Foreign Relations Committee Chairman, Robert Menendez of New Jersey and the ranking member on that committee, James Risch of Idaho. So again, bipartisan effort being put forth on the Peace Corps Reauthorization Act in the Senate, approved 
by a voice vote by the full Senate Foreign Relations Committee and with Republican co-sponsors, including Rob Portman of Ohio, Todd Young, Indiana, John Cornyn of Texas and Susan Collins of Maine. Next slide, please. So one of the things that makes this so significant is the broad, the width and the depth of the items that are included in this legislation. And, and these are just some of the issues that appear in one or both versions of the bill. First of all, there's been uh, for the last 10, 11 years, a sexual assault advisory council that has worked on best practices uh, in addressing sexual assault and uh, supporting the Peace Corps and looking at ways to improve its response. Uh, that, was for, that was created by Congress but it has an a, a end date of the end of 2023. Uh, the legislation in the House would extend the Advisory Council to 2025. The Senate would extend that council to 2027. There's uh, both bills call for an extra month of paid health care when volunteers are coming out of the Peace Corps, uh, paid health care for two months instead of one month. Uh, there is a provision to raise up uh, non competitive eligibility for all RPCVs coming out of service to two years rather than one. A long battle over increasing a very meager workers compensation payment for affected RPCVs. Right now that is in both bills at different levels, but we are hoping to keep that in and hoping uh, to fight for that. Student loan support in the Senate bill. And then also in response to the tragic uh, circumstances in Tanzania, uh, a provision that would have allowed the Peace Corps director to suspend agency staff for serious misconduct without pay. There are other things in the bill and we will send you links to those um, at a later time. Next slide, please. So what can you do to help in these next few months if you don't have, and many of our affiliate groups do have advocacy coordinators or liaisons, please identify somebody to serve as a point person to be in touch with us. Coordinate meetings. We've got lots of meetings going on right now with members of Congress, virtual meetings, in-house in or in-state district meetings. We are working on op-eds and letters to the editor. And uh, if you are a writer and would like to take part on that, please, I'll be putting my email in the link and please encourage uh, your members to do the same. We wanna continue to press forward with messages to Congress. We wanna get at least 20,000 messages in there. Uh, we expect a special action to mark September 22nd, when the original Peace Corps Act was signed into law. And then be prepared to work on this through the end of December. We've got uh, elections coming up that's gonna, that's gonna present some challenges with, with the time that Congress will be in session, but we've gotta be ready every step of the way from right now until the end of December to make sure we get this bill passed this year. And we're also working in closing to work on making sure that per Carol Spahn is confirmed as the next Peace Corps director. So I think that wraps up my slides and thank you, Christina, and back to you. Great, thank you, Jonathan. <clears throat> now we're gonna hear some updates from my fellow board directors, um, Beto Whitaker and Evelyn Gens Glass. Since early summer, they have been leading two crucial and important task force, and I will pass it to Evelyn to tell you about the Community Concerns Task Force. Great, thanks, uh, Christina. Um, the Community Concerns Task Force was created uh, to listen to community complaints, as it suggests, and to recommend actions the board could take uh, to address these, as, uh, these concerns, these complaints, as best as we can right now and also to set in motion activities that potentially could lead to longer term changes. Uh, and the whole focus is to create a more transparent, inclusive and mutually accountable NPCA culture. Uh, the task force is made up of Gretchen Uphold, who's our um, treasurer, Chip Levengood, who heads up the governance committee, Beto Whitaker, um, who is the chair of the DEI task force, and Faith Van Gilder, uh, who's an, another NPCA board members. And we, over, we have overlapping membership between these two task forces uh, very consciously because these are interconnected act activities. 
Um, as soon as we were appointed, I reached out to the, to the community through, um, uh, and to the staff. Uh, and so far we have conducted uh, five interviews uh, with groups and individuals who've uh, come forward to, to talk about uh, issues they think are um, important for us to hear about. Um, we're open to additional um, complaints, if you will, and concerns being raised. Uh, we basically go out of um, operation at the end of September, but uh, up until now, and you'll hear about other things that we're setting in motion uh, to continue this, but we'd love, if you want to talk to us, please let us know. And the recommendations I'm gonna talk about directly flow from what we've heard through these interviews. The first one uh, is to create a, a committee on um, governance reform. And you've heard that that's already been um, started. Um, and Christina is one of the co-chairs. And I'll say it again, I'm really interested in having membership from the community. So if you're interested, uh, please, please let Christina or John know. And these recommendations will require some of these recommendations that they come up with uh, may well require changes in NPCA bylaws. And any of those changes will have to go back to the community, uh, to all of you to be voted on. Um, uh, so this is a longer term strategy. It, changes can't happen overnight because we really do want to go through the whole process of, of doing that. Second um, activity is asking the affiliate group network and your coordinator to examine the relationship between MPCA and affiliates. What's working, what isn't, um, what are the, your priorities for change? One step in this process uh, will be a set of affiliate group meetings that are being planned for the fall. And I'm sure Christina is gonna talk to you about that as well. The member elected directors, and I'm a, one of the member elected directors uh, for the um, Mid-Atlantic and the national groups, uh, have a role in both receiving and resolving uh, community complaints. But the truth is that this role isn't, hasn't been well publicized, um, and it really hasn't been well implemented up until now. We're asking the member elected directors and the community to better define uh, this role and, um, and then we'll put in place those changes being, um, being recommended. We've pulled together information about existing complaint paths, uh, including whist whistleblower policy uh, that staff, consultants, and volunteers can use. And that information plus the, the um, member elected route uh, that I just mentioned uh, will be posted on the, on the NPCA website, included in manuals, included in onboarding materials, so everybody in the whole community really knows how to communicate. And then my, my last uh, point, number five, is really at the moment a catch-all for a number of recommendations uh, that are being considered for increasing accountability and transparency in relationships between MPCA and the MPCA uh, community. For example, strengthening administrative policies and procedures to clarify who does what, when, what, how, and when, uh, when agreements are formed, uh, how to improve uh, and tighten up some of the contracting and other functions that, that are in place. For all of this, um, we welcome your input. And I know there isn't really time for Q&A at the moment, but I'd be happy to engage with you um, offline about any of this. Thanks. Yeah, it, uh, thank you, Evelyn. And also, if you do have questions for Evelyn, um, she posted her, oh, well, Julie put her um, email in there. And also you can um, just post it in the chat. We're gonna be monitoring that and, and follow up with you all. Now I'm gonna pass it off to Beto. And I've, I, it's been, I've been involved with this um, task force as well. And go ahead. Well, thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, just wanted to share a little bit about uh, the di uh, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Task Force. Um, we have been um, solid and strong and uh, really 
beginning to look at um, you know, some of the processes that are, uh, have been established, and more importantly, how can we integrate uh, DEI in everything that we do? And that would be internal as well as external. So the charge for us is to evaluate the operations of MPCA through a DEI lens and make recommendations to enhance that uh, culture um, of MPCA. Um, and this task force also lists recommendations uh, that we will make to the board uh, in September and uh, draft some DEI policies. So currently our membership consists of Carla Brown, uh, Christina Owens, Evelyn Gasglass, uh, Gansglass, Michael Roman, and yours truly. Some of our goals consist of actually looking at all of MPCA work and looking at it through a DEI lens. And so what does that mean? It means that everything that we do, um, our, our DEI statements, anything would be would reflect diversity and inclusion. We want to be as inclusive as possible, and that is both with uh, you know internally and externally. So we want to ensure that the DEI statement and the employee handbook reflect areas of religious freedom, ability, disability, gender, gender bias, and for that there is zero tolerance. And we you know we really want a strong enough statement to make that plain. Um, also inclusive of, of the, um, you know, DEI should, as I said, should be beyond uh, internally. We want to look at this uh, throughout our whole, um, all of our stakeholders. And then engage the greater um, uh, Peace Corps, our, uh, return Peace Corps volunteer community in the DEI work. So one of the things that we have been really uh, at working um, actively about is how can we design a vehicle so that you can provide input, so we can get input, input from uh, um, the greater community, our stakeholder, our board, as well as the staff. So we are creating a system for that. And then how do we make a DEI a uh, uh, priority? Um, and I, I will say this because I've shared it, you know, I think too often we get, um, you know, excited about a certain thing and then it kind of dwindles off and we really want, you know, to keep this front and center and then ensure that there is a tool developed to measure success. So um, not only do we put this in, in place, but we also want to be able to, to look at, have we reached any benchmarks? Have we made progress um, and, and see where we are? And, you know, if there are gaps, then we can review and see um, how, um, you know, we can um, fix those gaps. And then our recommendations to the board, and this will be for September, to establish um, a special uh, DEI committee. Um, currently, we cannot have a standing committee because it has to be voted upon. However, I want to stress here that one of our intentions is to request to have a um, special committee established. Um, and then as we move forward um, to really revisit this um, and, and actually have a standing DEI committee. And that committee would be representative of board, staff, and the greater um, RPCV community. And then for those that, you know, don't want to be as involved, but would like to provide advice and, and, and um, you know, advice to this committee, establishing a DEI advisory. This would be a larger group of internal and external stakeholders. Um, you know, I can share with you that I've gotten a lot of emails, um, you know, from people who have provided wonderful um, suggestions and how we can proceed with this. And, you know, I, you know, want to open up that opportunity, or we want to open up that opportunity so that, uh, you know, that voice is being heard and we are gaining input um, into how we're going to move forward. And then the second recommendation will be unconscious bias training for the board staff, the community, and any other stakeholders. And it's been brought to my attention that um, the Northern Virginia affiliate group has done this in the past. So I will be reaching out to them uh, to get some input um, you know, on that, uh, on the training that they provided, um, et cetera. And then enhance uh, HR policies and organizational culture uh, by ensuring the processes are established and that they are articulated in the employee handbook and uh, with this um, strong DEI statement. So those are the recommendations that we will be making to the board um, in uh, September. And so I just want to thank you. And um, once again, you know, please feel free to reach out to me if you have any further questions or definitely if you have any um, suggestions. And lastly, you know, as we move forward and once this has been approved, 
you know, I hope that you will um, reach out and, and with a willingness to join this, this effort. So thank you. Thank you, Beto. Um, again, if you have questions for him, drop it in the chat. Um, also, we'll have a, um, his contact information as well. Um, and I imagine Beto and Evelyn will be around throughout the meeting. So um, when we move into um, breakout rooms, there might be opportunity there as well. So now we're going to be moving on to the Lorette Miller Ruby Award nominee presentations. Um, they're going to there are three different videos, and they're going to be um, um, run one after another. But just to give you a really um, quick background, uh, again we have three finalists for the um, for this annual um, award. Um, for outstanding community service. And the award is named for Lorette Miller Rupi, a previous Peace Corps director and staunch supporter of the autonomy of the agency. Under her direction, Peace Corps resumed programs in seven countries and by the end of her tenure had achieved a 50% increase in budget. The award honorees honors outstanding affiliate groups for projects that promote the third goal, uh, third goal of the Peace Corps strengthening Americans' understanding about the world and its people, and for or continue to serve host countries, build group spirit and cooperation, and promote service. Eligible projects include those completed within the past two years or ongoing for at least three years. The purpose of the award is to recognize the great work that MBCA's groups are doing and to generate ideas that other groups may emulate in their communities. And the three nominees, so you just know ahead of time, and we'll start out the videos. One is the RPCVs of Wisconsin um, Madison, and then the RPCVs for Environmental Action, and Partnering for Peace, Friends of Moldova, and RPCV Alliance for Ukraine. So I'll let our go ahead. Hi, I'm Madeline Uranik, and coming to you from the RPCVs of Wisconsin-Madison, and we are honored uh, to nominate our uh, event. We have an event called Freeze for Food. It is a walk-run fundraising event, and as you know, anyone can do an event great one time, but we thought we would celebrate our 40th anniversary. We have been doing this walk-run event for uh, 40 years, and we're really proud of it. So how do we do it? This uh, We have an intrepid coordinating committee. You've all coordinated big events, so you know there's a lot uh, that goes on, and they work for about six months to put this event together. And we get the entire uh, RPCVs of Madison involved sooner or later, the day of race, walking and running, takes about 50 people, volunteers, to staff the registration tables and guide the runners and walkers out on the course, serve the food. And we've had great uh, TV coverage of people interested in what we're doing. So the way we fund it is that we actually take monies that you might even be involved in if you've ever bought an international calendar and we take um, some seed funding. This year it was $2,000 to get it started so that all of the participant dollars, all of the sponsor dollars can go directly to the group that we have chosen. And the group that we have chosen since 2017 has been a group called Open Doors for Refugees. And they are an all-volunteer nonprofit group here in Madison. They furnish the apartments and provide transportations and ESL, translation and employment service for newly arriving refugees to this area. And uh, they in turn partner with the Jewish Social Services, or JSS, um, which has the federal contract for the refugees coming to Madison. And this enables JSS to go far beyond what it can do just itself. So the third goal is involved in all of this. We're bringing our Peace Corps experience back to the US uh, to share it. Uh, and since uh, from 27 to 22, the events that we've highlighted have featured refugee issues uh, through the promotion and fundraising and TV coverage. So 
different refugee groups come to different cities and these are the groups that come to Madison. The results, especially the fast, past two years, partly thanks to COVID, have been just fantastic. And in um, 21 and 22, uh, we were able to give record amounts to Open Doors for Refugees records, not only for um, uh, the Open Doors, but for us, as we had a record number of participants and generosity. And Open Doors, in turn, was able to take on new projects for the refugees, uh, for example, education and employment, employment and COVID relief. So the big picture is that to date, this single RPCV Madison event has raised $127,000. We've given it to a variety of domestic and international groups uh, to address poverty and food security. And it's very replicable, given that you have the, the stamina and uh, the dedication. We have very good um, records that we would be happy to share with any other group. We will say that doing a sports event has enabled us to bring in a lot of young people who are very attuned to global issues, and this has been a benefit for us. So in summary, um, Freeze for Food, this event effectively uses your purchases of the international calendar. It supports important community and international organizations. It raises uh, awareness of poverty, food scarcity, and refugee issues. It has helped us spotlight our own uh, group's contributions, and it has built and maintained um, a family-friendly community event. So year after year, for 40 years, Freeze for Food has made Wisconsin winters more warm-hearted. Thank you for your consideration. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Meredith Miller Vostries, and I'm excited to be here on behalf of Return Peace Corps for Environmental Action and their nomination for the Rupi Awards. Returned Peace Corps Volunteers for Environmental Action is an affiliate group that acts with passion for climate solutions and environmental well being. Our mission is to empower the Peace Corps community to act for climate solutions, reverse environmental degradation, promote sustainable development, and advocate for action. And we've done a lot of that in partnership with many of you who are here today. So I'm gonna focus on the last two years of our work, but I just wanted to give you a broader timeline of our affiliate group. RPCV for EA was established in 2015. A few years later, we established our Peace Corps Action Team, which is a partnership with Citizens Climate Lobby, a really large advocacy organization that we've been engaged with. Um, and then we've really catalyzed, expanded um, our activities and our um, organization since 2020. Um, after the Global Issues Survey and developed several action teams that meet monthly, which I'll go into now. So many of you may have participated in the NPCA's Global Issues Survey in 2020. During that time, climate change was identified as the number one issue that our PCVs care most about, which we were very excited to see. And we wanted to leverage that and take advantage of that. As a response to that call to action, and uh, the prioritization of climate change, we've uh, undertaken, Return Peace Corps for Volunteers for Environmental Action has undertaken um, some internal strengthening and some increased outreach and engagement. In 2021, we established our letters to the editor action team, and those are monthly meetings to raise awareness about climate, and they're often aligned with current events such as Ukraine, climate displacement, um, and most recently, some of the legislation that we're seeing on the Hill that we hope passes for, for climate. In addition, the letters to the editor action team collaborated with MPCA on their Peace Corps reauthorization campaign. And over the last year, oh, nearly 100 letters to the editor have been published in local newspapers around the country, ranging from the New York Times to the Journal in West Virginia. So that's been really exciting. Um, same year in 2021, we formalized the organization and developed our a formal board of directors. 
We also developed a strategic plan and strengthened internal operations as we engage in getting a nonprofit status, which is underway. And our board of directors meets monthly and a lot of the board members that you see here, our leadership team, also help lead our action teams that meet monthly. So hopefully a lot of these faces, these friendly faces look familiar to you. Um, and they're all open to, to collaborating with, with all the other affiliate groups and allies. In 2022, we established our most recent action team, the Citizens Climate Science Action Team, also a very organic process coming out of our leadership team and our members that really wanted to discuss um, the latest science and opportunities for action, engaged citizen education and action. And they meet monthly, often having uh, environmental experts share information and are facilitating some community activities at schools and other with other organizations. In addition to our action teams, we have significant outreach and engagement, which hopefully many of you are aware of. If you're not, please learn and join us. We have a monthly newsletter that goes out to about 1,500 people on MailChimp. It has a pipeline of original articles. We spotlight return Peace Corps volunteers doing exciting work. We have monthly advocacy alerts um, for people to get engaged. We have a roundup of green news of interest. And then we feature a variety of articles from different members, such as book reviews and our most recent uh, monthly newsletter. We also have a fairly robust social media presence. A key feature of what we do also is events. We find those are a great way to collaborate with other RPCV affiliate groups and allies and um, people with shared passions and interests. So we've done uh, several every year with other organizations to raise awareness, uh, provide opportunities for advocacy and action. Our events have included documentary films, guest speakers, panel discussions. And here you can see a few of them. Um, our Chris, Kiss the Ground documentary film was done with Citizens Climate Lobby and the Kiss the Ground um, movie that was screened on January 6th during the Capitol uh, insurrection, which was interesting. We worked with the Peace Corps community for refugees and had a great event with uh, on climate change and migration. We've worked with the MPCA affiliate group results uh, to focus on the intersection of global health and climate change. We've also done quite a bit on the advocacy front, working on getting elected officials to act, um, outreach to other affiliate groups, and also working with friends like Friends of Kiribati and others um, to raise awareness about climate change in specific locations. Our next event we invite you to join us is September 12th. Uh, Return Peace Corps for Volunteers for Environmental Action is partnering with Results and RPCVs that work at Project Drawdown to talk about the intersection of climate and poverty. And this event, September 12th, we'll talk more about at AGNAM, and it's also on the NPCA website. If you go to events and uh, go to September 12th, you'll see it, and you can sign up and join us. In conclusion, I would say that the Return Peace Corps Volunteers for Environmental Action are really working to not only fulfill our charge to raise uh, awareness and action on climate change, but also to really fulfill the third goal of Peace Corps. And we've been doing that um, largely, I would say, through an environmental lens. The RPCV for EA efforts have raised awareness about, by, about climate change through bipartisan advocacy, we have publications and newsletters that link local and global issues. And we have public events that give RPCVs a voice to amplify issues of importance from climate change to climate justice locally and globally. So I think that this group has done a really great job um, leveraging RPCV's unique role in addressing climate change and the credibility that people believe that we have to raise awareness and engage people in action. So our group has become much more accountable to its membership over the last two years, is really fulfilling its mission to empower the Peace Corps community to act for climate solutions. And I think that the Return Peace Corps volunteers has a great model, um, a partnership model where they are really leveraging community members in our RPCV community, as well as affiliate groups and allied organizations to be a force for change. And we welcome you to join us. Our website is active, you can go there. And I thank you so much for learning about our group and hope that we can collaborate with you going forward. Cheers.
It is an honor to be here today on behalf of the RPCV Alliance for Ukraine to acknowledge the acts of service of fellow Rupi Award nominees, especially our partners, the Friends of Moldova and Partnering for Peace. More importantly, we are here to continue and strengthen that service at a time of overwhelming need. In February 2022, Vladimir Putin launched a full-scale assault on Ukraine, a country of more than 40 million people and a second home to more than 3,000 returned Peace Corps volunteers. Many of our friends and family members have fled, others are fighting to defend their communities, and some are no longer with us. Everyone who served in Ukraine knows somebody affected by the war. Driven by violent attacks on civilians, one in three people have fled, seven million are displaced internally, five million are scattered around the globe, and still 13 million are stuck, experiencing food and water shortages, but unable to leave because the roads and bridges are destroyed. When the invasion started, Ukraine or PCVs rapidly mobilized to assist our Ukrainian friends, family members, colleagues, and communities. We are raising awareness, sending money and supplies, engaging mass media, and directly assisting with transportation, housing, and money to survive. The Alliance has delivered $280,000 worth of trauma first aid supplies. Our new grant program, funded by sales of our Ukrainian cookbook, is delivering $20,000 to local humanitarian aid projects. And, We've started a Uniting for Ukraine sponsorship initiative, connecting Ukrainians with sponsors so that they can find refuge in the United States. Every day, Ukraine RPCVs are connecting on a grassroots level to distribute needed resources and information. However, the initial wave of global attention seems to have crested while we're in this for the long haul. We need partners who are as well. Thanks to the leadership of fellow Ukraine RPCVs, including Rotary Peace Fellows like Shannon Carter, We've connected with Partnering for Peace to work on a global grant for humanitarian aid, and our good friends in Moldova have stepped up to take in refugees, for which we are forever grateful. It is in the worst of times that such collaborations show their value, and we're glad to know that we're not alone. With that, let me introduce the Friends of Moldova. Since Russia invaded Ukraine, over half a million refugees have crossed the border into neighboring Moldova. Recently, more than a 1,000 come each day, with no end of the war in sight. This affront to world peace and stability has struck at the hearts of those affiliated with peace initiatives throughout Rotary and the Peace Corps. The Friends of Moldova, an official member group of the National Peace Corps Association, was founded as a passion project in 2020 by a group of returned Peace Corps volunteers, or RPCVs. Its mission was to support Moldovan civil and youth activists by offering grants to select projects, when the war in Ukraine began, however, the Friends of Moldova jumped into action. Some of us dropped everything to travel to Moldova and coordinate direct assistance to refugees, together with our local partners. Others of us back home in the U.S. have raised funds and spoken out. Together, the entirely volunteer-run Friends of Moldova has raised more than $680,000, one of the largest relief efforts ever undertaken by a Friends of group of returned Peace Corps volunteers. Carol Spahn, the director of the Peace Corps, flew to Moldova to help serve meals at the Friends of Moldova's first refugee assistance center. Moldova's president, Maya Sandu, visited as well. Our distribution centers have now directly provided free food, clothing, and sanitary items to tens of thousands of Ukrainian refugees and assisted 175 other Moldovan relief efforts. Today, the Friends of Moldova spend $20,000 a week or more to stock our distribution centers. Money, not time or goodwill, has limited our ability to support the refugee community in Moldova. That's why we've been so excited to team up recently with Rotary International to obtain new funding. Rotary clubs from Oklahoma City to Raleigh, North Carolina, have worked with RPCVs and the Friends of Moldova to secure disaster response grants from Rotary. Others will follow. Partnering for Peace, the RPCV Alliance for Ukraine, and the Friends of Moldova exemplify what is best about the Peace Corps and the RPCV community. Next, partnering for peace. In 2014, Peace Corps Director Carrie Hessler Radlett and Rotary General Secretary John Hugo signed a memorandum of understanding to promote their shared mission of service and sustainable community development. Those leaders understood that Rotary and Peace Corps' areas of focus virtually mirrored one another. The MOU was signed as I began my service in Peace Corps, Georgia. Unaware of the global agreement, I connected with the Rotary in Tbilisi. It just seemed logical. Partnering for Peace is a nonprofit built to support the Rotary Peace Corps relationship through awareness, education, and outreach. 
It has supported joint projects, stocking library shelves in PCV villages, administered health screenings, provided microloans, organized sanitation, water, and hygiene projects, vocational training, and conflict resolution programs align perfectly with Peace Corps' third goal. Our members plan several multinational Rotary Youth Leadership Award conferences for Ukraine. Our website documents over $1 million in joint projects. The war in Ukraine has brought Rotary and RPCVs together to aid Ukrainian citizens and refugees. Members have supported funding and assisted on the ground, coordinating with RPCV Alliance for Ukraine and Friends of Moldova and Rotary Clubs around the world. Fundraisers, donations, Rotary grants, and local support are now the norm. As president of Partnering for Peace, I was recently asked to assist Rotarians in Paris who needed people to unload emergency supplies from Spain to Moldova. Friends of Moldova could assist with that. There is so much we can do together. Partnering for Peace is honored to play just a small part in connecting the Rotary community with these passionate MPCA affiliate groups. Those were amazing um, videos. You all will have a chance to um, ask questions to each of the nominees. We're gonna have breakout rooms, a uh, breakout room for RPCVs of Wisconsin Madison, RPCVs for Environmental Action, and the RPCV Alliance for Ukraine, Friends of Moldova, and Partnering for Peace, Peace Corps Friends of Rotary. And those who were asking, we will, at the end of this, you'll have a link, we'll, a Google form will be dropped into the chat so you guys can vote. I want to introduce Ari, you all have probably know her um, through your interactions. And she, for me, she has been a wonderful partner in all the planning and the, the things that we want to do to help you all. So um, yeah, we're, we'll add the link again, Kate. Okay, I'll pass it on to Ari. Thanks so much, Christina. I'm Ari Richard. I'm the Affiliate Group Network por uh, Program Coordinator here at NPCA. And in this presentation, I'm gonna be going over our affiliate group strengthening efforts over the last couple of years and how that's impacted where we're going now. Um, our goal is to have a tightly knit affiliate group network that is able to collaborate on the global issues that matter most to the Peace Corps community. Uh, slide, please. All right, so where we started, um, our work on social action as a campaign uh, really began with the launch of the Global Issues Survey in 2020, where we sought to discover what issues the Peace Corps community wanted to address the most. Um, and you heard Meredith talk a little bit about our work with the RPCVs for environmental action. Um, so what we really wanted to tackle there was the building of the internal capacity of that group the increasing member engagement and increasing the reach of the group to connect with other affiliates to tackle that top issue of climate change. Uh, as that came out as the most overwhelming and pressing issue that our community wanted to address. As we moved through those stages in our work, um, we came up with a few lessons as we went through um, that social action efforts have really, for the most part, been very independent and siloed, um, consisting mostly of one-on-one -on -one contact between NPCA and affiliate groups, and less so from affiliate group to affiliate group. So although we were setting out to build this social impact model, uh, we realized that we needed to include more of the community um, and have more information sharing access so these projects are not just initiated one at a time. Slide, please. Uh, so where are we headed after that? Um, we've realized that these are not separate issues. So issues like climate change, equality, and poverty, um, they actually all interact and impact one another. So why not build an infrastructure that uses a more intersectional approach? Uh, next slide, please. So the first step in achieving a more connected network is to build an infrastructure that better facilitates that connection. We're going to do this by building our new affiliate group network forum, which I'll talk about in a few moments, adopting a new CRM to accommodate a more closely connected network, 
and fostering an inclusive environment in our community. When we build out this infrastructure, we'll be able to begin strengthening those connections, facilitating better flows of information, and improving pathways to intergroup collaboration. There's been obstacles in the past um, that can prevent some of that uh, networking, and we really want to tackle those issues uh, head on. Uh, we'll achieve success in this endeavor when our affiliate group network is better connected and able to have sustained collaboration and information sharing to tackle all of these issues that we're passionate about. And we're not expecting each affiliate group uh, to take on all of these issues at once. We just want to make sure that we're being more inclusive in the issues um, that each affiliate group may care about. Um, let's hit next slide. So this is the affiliate group network forum structure. I know it's a little daunting to look at, but I'm going to walk us through it. Um, the purpose of this forum is to have representatives from all affiliate group types, uh, diverse global issues, external partners, and community and NPCA staff voices all coming together in the same table uh, to talk about the processes that will better connect our groups and therefore increase our social impact as a community. This first forum will be appointed by the affiliate group network coordinator as determined in the NPCA bylaws, but we want to design this as a member election process for future representatives. Uh, so not only is this forum going to meet regularly on these network issues, but the whole community as well will be invited to engage and provide input. Um, we know that this process is going to foster a more diverse and better connected network for all of our affiliate groups. Uh, we've already begun this process of building this infrastructure and we're going to continue moving ahead in the uh, weeks and months uh, to come and filling out these seats. Um, so real quick before I, I close here, I want to go ahead and thank the representatives who have uh, uh, volunteered to step into these roles to help build this first forum um, to continue making social impact. So representing the Citizen Action Advocacy Network is Meredith Lee Stover. Representing the Refugee Support Network is Peter Diekel. Representing the Climate Solutions Network is Mel Meredith miller vostries Representing Third Goal Intercultural Network is Tony Agnello. And representing cause groups is Karen Burry. So we've got a few more seats to fill out and we're going to be working on that in the coming weeks. Um, if you have any questions for me, um, if you'd like to talk more about this network structure, please send an email to groups at peacecorpconnect.org. We'll also have a post event survey after today's meeting uh, where you can drop additional questions and send those on to us uh, so that we can go ahead and follow up with you. Um, but here to talk more about how they approach important global issues, uh, we have RPCVs for Environmental Action and Global Allies Program, Partners Ending Poverty with Results. Um, it's a treat and we're happy to have them talk about their collaborative uh, projects together. So please, uh, without further ado, take it away. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Ari. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Karen Burry. Um, and I'm part of the Global Allies Program, Partners Ending Poverty with Results, or GAP for short. Um, and we'd like to share a little bit about um, our partnership that we've established over the last year with RPCVs for Environmental Action. Uh, next slide, please. So we first met uh, RPCVs for EA at the last AGNAM uh, meeting in 2021. At that time, we were only a four month old affiliate group. Uh, so everything was very new to us. And by joining this meeting, we had the opportunity to meet and learn from other affiliate groups within the NPCA network. Um, following AGNAM, we continue to follow up uh, both with uh, Kate Schachter and Meredith Postries uh, through follow up meetings and conversations to uh, talk about uh, mutual issues uh, that we work on that align, global health, global education, development, and climate change. Uh, in January, we hosted our first event, uh, which featured Dr. Cheryl Holder, who's a clinician, co-chair of the Florida Medical uh, Society Consortium on Global Health, uh, Global Climate Change and Global Health. Um, and the event got so much attention. Uh, we had over 100 RPCVs, uh, from our collective networks uh, register and attend. And following the event, we saw that there was more potential to grow together. Next slide. Um, we learned that uh, now is a critical moment more than ever to be engaging as many people as possible, 
not only to build awareness, but to move from complacency towards action to draw positive change. Um, currently in our environment, we're struggling with issues of climate, international diplomacy, global poverty, pandemics, and slipping democracy, which could be very overwhelming, frustrating, and anxiety producing uh, for members of both of our networks. Um, silence and inaction on these issues is complicity. And we know that that's not what our PCBs do. The solution to these problems are available to us and our engagement, as well as bringing others into the fold is the only way to address them. Next slide. So we believe that we're stronger together. The benefits of our partnership uh, have developed in ways of friendship, of shared knowledge and resources, and uh, our extended networks now working together have an increased collective impact on these issues. So in this case, one plus one equals three. Since our first meeting at AGNAM and our joint event earlier this year, uh, we at GAP and our PCBs for Environmental Action have had continued communication, sharing mutual goals and benchmarks for these issues, sharing creative ideas and flexibility in order to put the best possible programs and events forward. Next slide. Our regular conversations and meetings developed into a plan for our next joint event at the intersection of climate change and poverty, solutions to advance human and planetary well-being. And this event has been inspired by a stellar report and research by Project Drawdown. So here with me today um, is Carissa Patron mycuri of Project Drawdown and our partner from our SPCVs from Environmental Action, Meredith Bostries. So now I'll pass it over to Meredith. Thanks, Karen. I just briefly want to say that it's been really a pleasure to work with all these affiliate groups and people. We do really see our strength um, as working together and the solutions are really intersectional. So we're excited to plan this next event. And I just wanted to put a little plug in that the process of our partnership has been um, very organic in many ways, very Peace Corps style. Um, the initial global health and um, environment uh, event that we had with Cheryl Holder in partnership with GAP Results. Um, we included a lot of the participants, including Carissa from Project Drawdown. So in the chat, like we're seeing large chat conversations today, Carissa said, hi, I'm an RPCV, really interested in this event. Thanks for having us. And then after the event, I went and looked up who Carissa was and was blown away by all the amazing work that Carissa, fellow RPCVs, and her team at Project Drawdown are doing. And so that led us to a conversation and now the next event on September 12th that we invite you to. And Carissa is gonna tell you a little bit more about that. Over to you, Carissa. Thanks, Meredith. And I'm happy to be here with all of you today. Uh, I'm Carissa and I'm the program coordinator with Drawdown Lift, a program of Project Drawdown that really focuses on deepening the collective understanding of the links between climate change solutions and poverty alleviation with a particular focus. And Africa and South Asia. So it's been a privilege collaborating with our PCVs for environmental action and also results at kind of like working and collaborating around this intersection. So the Drawdown Lift team, which is a small team of three, which my direct colleague is also an RPCV who served in Niger, I served in Nicaragua. Uh, we re recently launched a landmark report called Climate Poverty Connections, which I can drop in the chat now, along with a two page fact sheet that kind of summarizes the report. And it really summarizes em evidence around human well being benefits of climate mitigation solutions specifically, but also have vast um, benefits for adaptation and resilience as well. So we know that in low and middle income countries, addressing climate change and improving the well-being of people experiencing poverty must occur simultaneously. We can't have one without the other. And unfortunately, the benefits of addressing climate change and boosting human well-being have been commonly overlooked, despite their sub substantial contributions to livelihoods, health, equity, resilience, and the environment. And it's really important to recognize that within this work, those who are most impacted have historically and continue to contribute the least to climate change. So 
For example, the continent of Africa as a whole has only contributed around 3% of cumulative carbon dioxide emissions since the 1700s. So with that in mind, we all have a responsibility to really take both individual and collective action to work towards systemic change and better support our global community through climate action. So I'll share a little bit more and do a deep dive into the report and the findings and how climate change solutions can provide a low carbon pathway to prosperity coming up in September. And we hope that you all can join us. So Karen, now back to you. Thanks so much, Carissa. So now we wanna open up the discussion with all of you on why climate and poverty issues are important to all of us. Um, we have a couple of questions that we'd like to ask you to get a sense of how you're feeling about these issues. Um, so I'd like Ari, if she can, to start the poll. On a scale of one to five, how much has climate change affected your life, with five being the highest effect? Okay, so it's about 38% uh, of, or giving kind of a middle um, assessment in terms of how much climate change has affected their life. Um, our next question is, do you think climate change is making poverty worse for the people that you served as a volunteer in the Peace Corps? And to that response was about 38%. Of course, everyone's answering a five. Um, and you'll find some more details about this and uh, the report that Chris will be sharing on the September 12th event. And our very last question, our final question, is if you'd like to know more on what to do about climate change and poverty. And we have 31%. Um, who've uh, answered a five. So uh, the best way to find out is to join us at uh, the upcoming event. So I will go ahead and share, or next slide, I'll go ahead and share the invitation. Um, we'd love to continue this discussion with you all um, at our upcoming event, which will feature a panel from Cole Gautam, uh, who was awarded uh, by the Peace Corps um, and is also a UNICEF and UN official. Um, you'll hear more from Carissa, who shared today, and Neil Boyer, who is an economist and the Peace Corps uh, Program Specialist on Environment. Um, so we do hope to see you all um, at this event. We'll go ahead and drop the link to register in the chat. Um, and there we hope to make better connections between climate and poverty, take advocacy actions together, um, giving everyone a chance to do more and become a change agent. Um, so we'll like to invite you to have continued learning and have a chance uh, to make solutions for people and the planet. Thanks so much. And I think with that, I'm passing it back to Christina. Unless Ari, did you wanna say anything? I had a couple more things before we get to our next. Um, um, I just wanted to, um, talk more about um, the AGN advisory committee. That's something uh, or forum we've been playing around um, on possible different name changes, but um, the actual advisory committee is embedded in our bylaws. And so this is, um, this is in part is an effort to get back to the important step um, appropriately representing the affiliate group. So according to our bylaws, the AGN advisory committee um, has a set responsibilities. They set the agenda for an AGN annual meeting. So they would, this um, committee will help, help establish that for next year and then establish procedures for bringing matters before the AGN annual meeting and then set the date and the agenda for the additional meetings of the AGN. So we can have more than one meeting if we wanted to. Identify concerns of the affiliate groups to be referred to the board. Um, and I would, it, as the chair of that committee, I would um, um, coordinate that and tell um, the board about it, and then assist the governance committee with the nomination and election of the AGN coordinator in an election year in this, in a case of vacancy. So my term is two years, and so in two years, we, you all can again participate in electing um, the next AGN coordinator. So before we go, we're going to have a World Cafe session, but before we wanted to give you some reminders we invite you to join the annual general membership meeting on September 24th. More information is coming. Also be sure to join the affiliate group network Facebook page. And I think, um, yep, 
Julie's um, putting that all into the um, the chat. Thank you, Julie. Um, look for the next affiliate group newsletter that's coming out on September 15th. Stay tuned for information about Peace Corps Connect 2023. I think we're looking for people to host. And check out the MPCA um, events calendar. Uh, check the affiliate group news page for reminders and then complete the annual group reef affiliation process. If you need help, um, let Ari and I know um, and reach out to us anytime. And then of course we want to also celebrate the Worldview Magazine for being a finalist in, in three 2022 Eddie and Ozzy Awards. Uh, and let's go to the next. Um, okay, so now we're gonna break into um, the breakout rooms and I know some people had problems um, going into breakout rooms um, before so if you have a problem I think you could still stay in the in the main area and we'll um, answer some of your questions but um, there's going to be breakout rooms for country of service groups um, so past countries of service like I imagine Bolivia is the past one I know um, Dan and I and our fellow RPCVs want it to come back but that's and then also recent and current um, groups that's broken up and then the geographic groups which is small membership versus um, large memberships and then cause related workplace and affinity groups and if you're still having problems i'll stick around here um, to answer questions did any are you did you have any other additions Nope, those are all excellent. Um, thank you for sharing those reminders. And um, the breakout rooms have been opened up for everybody to start selecting where they'd like to be. Um, so if you're having trouble getting into those breakout rooms, um, please let us know and we can help assign you. And I do wanna highlight Dan Baker's comment in the chat um, about the Eddie and the Aussie Awards. Um, our comms team, has been doing an incredible job on our worldview digital and print uh, magazine. So we really wanted to give them, um, Oren Luke, Tiffany James, and Stephen Saum, um, a shout out for their amazing work on that. I think we have a, um, a couple of minutes before we uh, adjourn. Um, Julie, again, did a wonderful job. She posted a post event survey. Anybody who wants to share about what they talked about in their, um, in their groups, any aha moments? I can share a couple coming from the recent uh, group, uh, Country of Service. Um, there was great discussion and it was, um, a couple of things I noted down was the generational gap we were talking about, not in age, but in terms of service year. The Alliance for Ukraine brought up um, the the massive events and that you know as unfortunate as it is it seems to have been something that has coalesced this younger group uh and um also uh yeah the the big but unfortunate events seem to really catalyze that group and so um those were two two things that i got from our group i'm charlie hunt I'm the president of the Return Peace Corps Volunteers of Colorado. In our breakout group, uh, the, the conversation kind of revolves around when you're a large regional group and you're a statewide group, how do you get, how do you get representation on your board that represents the full state? So as an example, when I came on the board, almost everything was focused around Denver. And we've been developing, having representation around the front range of the state, which is the eastern, start, eastern side of the state, how do you get the engagement and get representation in areas around the state where the population is thinner? And not, we didn't come up with an answer for the question, but I'd like to put that out to the larger group. How do you do that? Great question. Thank you, Charlie. Uh, Evelyn, you're next. So in our group, we, we really, um, talked about collaborating across organizations. Helene Dudley from TCP Global, for example, and they focus on microloans, talked about trying to broaden um, collaboration with other groups that have expertise in education or in other topics. And it really goes to 
what you were all talking about, the intersectionality of, of all of these issues so that by working together across affiliate groups, um, that could make sense. Um, Pat Juan mentioned the Museum of the Peace Corps experience, interested in collaborating with other affiliate groups around uh, topics of interest, whether it's a country or you know, the environment or across areas, but that provides um, an opportunity for the museum to grow as well as for affiliate groups to showcase their issues and bring them to the, to the broader audience. And then we also talked a little bit about collaboration between, I think it's now 19, maybe Ari, I don't know exactly, 18, 19 um, Peace Corps groups and federal agencies and bringing, I guess, two ways, uh, bringing issues from countries of service and, and other affiliates to the federal agencies and having these groups host some of these conversations. But I would say also helping these, these groups, helping the affiliate groups tap into expertise within the agency on, on topics that are particularly relevant. Those were the, the main things we talked about. Great. Thank you, Evelyn. Yes, I, I um, well, I, I joined the, um, the Wisconsin group, but brought information about uh, what my current interest is, is nuclear weapons. I think a number of you are probably serving in countries where they signed and ratified a treaty to eliminate nuclear weapons. And this is an exciting treaty that's been uh, actually formulated and now is in the process of getting enforced. And there's an exciting story about it that nobody knows. Nobody and nobody knows about nuclear weapons these days. It's like the nun topic. And and I've been uh, probably making a pest of myself and, and running announcements on the chat. But we would love to offer a free Zoom course. Um, there is one one response so far, so I'm already excited about that. But there are more of you who might be interested. You could. Uh, we have 145 countries at this UN conference that said eliminate nuclear weapons. That was a non-proliferation conference I was at at the UN last week. It's very exciting news. And it's something that I think your Peace Corps groups would be interested in. So please do contact me if you find my name in the chat several times. Um, I would love to hear from you and we would love to arrange a, a course for you. Thank you. Thank you, Joanne. Um, Kim. Go ahead and let us yeah, thank, know. Thank you. I was in the uh, country of service, past country of service uh, group uh, in most of the countries are, are not being served now. We had uh, a little over a dozen people. I, I found it very interesting that there are different reasons that Peace Corps is not back in uh, countries, some of them because of um, religious differences, some of them because of uh, governmental changes, you can imagine. Um, uh, some of them uh, might like to get Peace Corps back, uh, uh, but haven't been able to. Um, the other thing that was very interesting is uh, several of the members uh, that we heard from were still doing projects in countries that Peace Corps uh, is no longer allowed to serve in. And uh, so they have uh, partners that they're still partnering with in, in those countries. Uh, and then uh, one country uh, where there's no longer Peace Corps service uh, is pretty wealthy and pretty well educated. Uh, so probably wouldn't need Peace Corps back for the traditional kind of work. So I thought those things were all very interesting. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Kim. Was there any more? If not, I'm gonna start concluding. But before adjourning, um, I want to, um, I want to give an extra shout out to um, MPCA staff who's been helping behind the scenes. Um, as you know, uh, virtual meetings can be challenging. We always come into uh, something that will go wrong. But I want to acknowledge um, Molly O'Brien, Jocelyn Cordell, um, Oren Luke, um, Julie Bilderback, Tiffany James, and um, also Dan Baker, who has been uh, a wonderful champion and advisor um, to Ari and I um, to help us with this event. Um, and then if I missed anybody, uh, I think the staff is amazing and they've been super helpful with all of this. Um, and 
and also finally to my fellow board members, thank you for stepping up and helping out and facilitating. I'm excited to um, move forward um, this coming year and really kind of take us to the next level. Um, and with that, I call for an adjournment. Great, thanks.